All right. Um, hello, everybody. We're here for the uh, pre-Sub-Zero panel, and we have uh, Lucas from Centrifuge, Thomas from Radical, and Maggie from Parity. Um, and just like some quick context here, Sub-Zero in the spring was supposed to be in San Francisco this year, um, but obviously that's not happening, so we're online. And um, a lot of the teams that are scheduled to speak at the Sub-Zero event are the US-based teams. Um, so. With this pre-panel, um, we thought I'd get some of the, the rest of the world involved. So uh, Lucas and Thomas uh, are both from Germany, uh, and Maggie is with our Asian team at Parity. So i um, just going to talk about some of the other projects in the Substrate ecosystem. Um, so yeah, I'll let them each give a quick like one or two minute intro of uh, their self and what they're working on. Um, so uh, I'll just go clockwise on my screen here. Uh, Lucas? Hey. Um... I'm uh, my name is Lucas. I'm a co-founder at Centrifuge. Um, and maybe just have a little bit of a technical background, um, but um, now do sort of all all, all sorts of things, um, including uh, launching a chain that we've been building on for the last year that's uh, based on Substrate. Um, maybe a bit about what Centrifuge does. Um, we are bu building a way for businesses, really anyone, to um, sort of bring their assets on chain that they have. So for example, as a business, you have invoices or materials um, that you want to borrow against. Um, so we, we allow um, our users to tokenize these assets, create different portfolios of these assets, and then borrow money against these assets. Um, and so like one of the things we've been doing from, from quite from very early on is working with with makers sort of to bring these um, sort of new collateral types into MCD, but also like really um, any other sort of like DeFi um, project that is interested in sort of providing liquidity to businesses can sort of use our protocol to like invest in, in different kinds of assets. So Maggie? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Maggie. I'm an engineer in property technologies. I'm now based in China and do some dev at a piece work around uh, Asia and China. Uh, basically, my job is to like spreading substrate and raise its adoption around uh, Asia, uh, typically China. And today, I'm gonna share with you at how is the real Asian community now and bring some star projects among the pop dot community to you guys. Okay, thanks. Awesome, uh, Thomas. Hi, I'm Thomas. Um, I am working for a company called Monadic, and what we are working on is uh, something called Radica, which is uh, a decentralized code collaboration stack. Uh, we started this um, two years ago, I believe, or more than two years ago, uh, but I joined the company one and a half years ago, and um, after exploring different options, like we, we landed uh, at, at Substrate, I think it was August last year when we made the uh, made the decision, and yeah, so this was also my my first real professional exposure to to Rust. Um, but so far, I like it and I'm very happy with it. Cool. So uh, for this panel, I kind of planned it out into like three sections. Um, the first is just like the state of Substrate development um, and what teams are doing right now, um, and then. The next is um, getting chains into production. Like we've seen a lot of a lot of people actually launching their chains, and then there's a lot more stuff that goes around that, like tooling and upgrades. Um, and then um, going to finish by talking about just like some of the future plans that people want to do with Substrate um, that don't exist yet. Um, so going to get started with just uh, what people are doing on Substrate now, and um, going to start with Maggie um, to give like a, an update on what what the Asian team is doing at Parity and like what you're seeing in some of the ecosystem teams out there. Um, and then like what features uh, people have been using a lot and like have been inter interesting in the last six months. Ah, okay. Uh, so from my knowledge, there are about like 40 teams in China that are building a substrate based blockchain. And also some famous universities and labs in China uh, starting to learn and evaluate substrate so they can use it in consortium blockchain circumstances. Uh, definitely, I'm gonna give a huge thumb up to Optin Walker and Inc., uh, which is the smart contract language in substrate. 
And Octa Walker like makes uh, Oracle and uh, heavy heavy calculation enabled in blockchain and Ink would ex accelerate the application construction and also lower the barrier of inexperienced developers. Uh, by the way, what I've seen in China is that Chinese companies prefer the consultant blockchain, so the Optum worker would enable them to safely connect the blockchain with the traditional database service, uh, which means that no more trade-offs if they want blockchain uh, in their own business. In their own business, yeah. And uh, these two features are really make uh, Substrate better. And on the runtime side, I've noticed that a number of new runtime modules added in the Substrate of time, and most of them are full of imagination. Uh, such as the re recovery module, which enables a person to gain access to his or her account if the private key is lost. Uh, this, is this is barely impossible in any other blockchain, and some crypto experts are researching like super hard algorithms, like uh, threshold signature scams to solve it. But uh, Substrate did it in an incredibly simple way, uh, a social recovery solution. This means a lot to blockchain developers, from my view. It just is just like that Substrate gives you a tool and also opens up your mind. So you can do it whatever you want. And, uh, you, you, and, and of course, you can do it effectively and freely. Yeah, that's from my view. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Thomas, uh, Radical, you guys are running proof of work. Um, on top of the implementation that we built, and I think you guys are like tweaked it a little bit. Um, but can you talk about like your choice to use proof of work and how it's influenced your runtime development on Substrate? Yes. Yeah, so um, obviously, it was a was a very good, very difficult choice. Um, um, but finally, we landed on it because it's the the operational simplicity mainly, and um, it's. It's well understood. That's that's something that uh, we were looking for. Um, so something that's not uh, too complicated and has a lot of unknowns. So we can really focus on on the value in the runtime that we're delivering. And um, yeah. So how how we approach this? There's this um, part. Uh, there's this consensus consensus crate uh, as part of the the substrate repository. Um, which is um, yeah, w which was built mainly for for Kulupu, um, but we found it very easy to uh, to adapt to to our case. Um, obviously, yeah, this because a lot of the runtime modules are really geared towards um, the the proof of stake and proof of, of authority. Um, we we really had to investigate and see okay well, how does this actually work what does this module do how can we sensibly integrate it we need to also understand it um, very well um, for example one one issue we ran into is like um, because you you need kind of block timestamps to calculate the difficulty um, the difficulty difficulty adjustment because they want to uh, kind of you kind of gonna guarantee a constant. Um, Block production rate. Otherwise, so we need you. We needed to to kind of disassemble uh, this block stem uh, block timestamp module and see what it actually does, how we can integrate it, and we are still not not certain that it does what we want or like that we integrated it well. But yeah, it's uh, um, so far it's it's uh, um, at least it's it's working, and now we just have to see and measure things and um, verify what does this thing it's supposed to do. Yeah, it'll be cool to see a proof of work chain in production because there are a lot of, say, uh, opinions in substrate modules that are kind of based around having like proof of stake. Um, so it'll be cool when you guys actually launch and um, we see it working. Yeah. Um, all right, Lucas. Um, so like I know, like in some of your invoice stuff, you've had to implement like some special multi-sig stuff. Um, can you talk about like how how you developed your solution and um, like some of the customizations you did? Um, yeah. So so like sort of the the thing we we're running a pretty standard um, substrate um, like 
deployment, I would call it, or subfit chain, um, where like we are using grandpa bay consensus and and finality, and we're using um, sort of we we decided to like diver, diverge from like polka dot or kusama's like like defaults as as little as possible, but um, and, and so most of our focus actually was around um, sort of adapting the runtime to um, suit our needs. And one of the like one of the big concerns for us is always um, key management and identities on chain, um, where like if you where he, um, like actually one of the problems that we see with especially if you have like enterprises or, or sort of teams um, use blockchains is that they cannot use um, keys as addresses because if if you sort of want to protect your um, if you want to protect your 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 key or your address um, your funds right um, like the minute you have someone even touch the recovery seed phrase or something like that right there's a you, you lose your identity like if that person is now not not trusted anymore not part of your team or who you knows what right and so I think substrates um, like first of all it's great that SR two five five one nine like supports threshold signatures and, and so there's um, an opportunity to, put, to sort of improve on that. Um, but what we really wanted is we wanted to have um, like very strong on-chain identities that um, actually have no like common um, sort of cryptography at all. And so we've started building a, like one of the things, and this is just a small part of this stack that we've been building for Centrifuge Chain, but one of the things we have been working on recently is um, we, we, we created a, um, a, a very simple multi-sig that allows you to have any kind of um, sort of other um, substrate origin. So, like it could be a and like an encryption on a, an, an, a signature key on a device. It can be a threshold key. It could be actually another multi-sig that controls a multi-sig. Um, sort of these these kind of, like so any kind of origin can sort of be added to a a multi-sig or to, to, we're calling it multi-account. So an account that is controlled by different accounts, um, and so that's that's like one of the for us last missing pieces to be able to offer sort of the um, production quality um, like security that we wanted to be able to have our, our validators run, um, and we wanted to ensure that our like even our users could use for storing funds safely instead of sorry doing these transactions. Yeah, cool. Um, so I think move on to the uh, getting into production stuff, um, which, yeah, it's cool to see like chains actually starting to launch now. Um, so I'm going to start with Thomas on this one. Um, you guys are launching your first chain pretty soon. Um, like, what were your infrastructure considerations and like how does proof of work affect this? Yeah, so um, it simplifies a lot of things, really but obviously it makes a lot of things harder. What it, one thing that it simplifies is the security aspect. Uh, we don't need to keep our validators safe, like uh, they don't manage keys. Like the miners, they just need to know um, like what's, what uh, the recipient address is and yeah, then you then you launch that and like it scales very easily. You, you just put a node on the network, it, behaves like any other node, um, you put miners on the network. But of course, this whole miner stuff, then um, what that entails is that you really need to build for that use case. And so this is an area where, of course, there's nothing with uh, that the substrate ecosystem gives us there, because it's uh, like that's not the main focus. And so these are the things that we then have to kind of tackle our own uh, on our own, like implementing these uh, these mining protocols, um, seeing how how we can uh, um, kind of integrate the nodes with with uh, specialized hardware, um, this stuff. And on the other hand, it's also the the telemetry and metrics, so like because this system behaves very differently in terms of how consensus is reached. Um, we also need to kind of check that and verify that um, 
um, differently. And so this is like where we also cannot rely on on a lot of the tools that Substrate provides us. And so we kind of need to to build our own on on top of that and look into that ourselves. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we have the tools eventually um, once things are stabilized and we don't have to have teams building like custom tools. I mean, it, it like a lot of the tools um, kind of work to a certain point, but then you kind of um, you kind of fail to to gain some very uh, interesting insights, um, like in in how the the system actually behaves, like which is important for proof of work. For example, I mentioned the the block production rate. That's something that you want to very closely monitor. And uh, for that kind of what we now using, we're just looking, okay, how many blocks are imported? But that's not the right thing to look at because you actually want to look at the timestamps of the, of the blocks and uh, to get a better metric for this. And so this is something um, that is not there yet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Lucas, um, speaking of tools for everybody, um, you guys made the Go RPC client. Um, so yeah, like what have you guys been working on to get centrifuge chain into production, and like, um, like what mo motivated you to build uh, Go RPC? Um, so, so maybe actually, I want to say say something about Thomas was saying, but yeah, first, yeah. Um, it, so I think like one one experience that we had was um, just that like sub, like substrate is extremely modular, but like. Yeah, if you deviate from like the well-trodden path that is done by Kusama and a few others before, it, a lot of stuff suddenly breaks. And for us, it is very different stuff that broke. Um, for example, um, Substrate has this like account index feature where you can you identify a key by an account index, and so like you have a much or so you identify an address as soon as an address has a balance or a transaction, like you can you get an index. And that index is shorter and like supposedly easier to use. Um, and like the UI has great support for it, and the tooling has great support for it, um, but it's not really something that's necessary. And so, like and in theory, like an address is how you should um, refer to your, like refer to another entity on chain. And so we removed this, um, and that, like, um, was uh, was a very painful like last month of like seeing where else it broke. Um, and yeah, actually, I see that Hung from in, from in the, from Fala Network is uh, um, <laughs> is saying that it's making trouble for them as well. So I think like what I want to say is that like yeah, like it it's still like early on. So like the this the scope that is tested is kind of small, and like so like when you go outside of that, like you suddenly see like oh like this is actually a uh, an unexpected like consequence, or like yeah, like maybe you like you're like missing some of these tools. Um, so actually, our decision was to add index back, the indices uh, palette back, because it was like if Polkadot and and uh, Kusama are using it, and it's it's going to make the developer and the user experience so much better that a lot of the tooling is going to be compatible. Whereas like as opposed to like for us trying to be incompatible, but uh, maybe actually um, I would be curious to hear maybe afterwards from Han on, on the, what their issue is with that. But um, you asked about um, GSRPC, um, and so one thing for us, um, I, Thomas, you said uh, it was your first um, work, work, like your first professional experience with Rust was starting to work as Substrate, and it, that was pretty much the case as well um, for us. Like we at, we started um, being like 100% Go. Um, focused about like Sunny Futures around two and, two and a half years old, and we built sort of a peer to peer layer and, and a stack that is loosely coupled to, to Ethereum, but sort of we're, we're migrating over now. But so we have a quite a big code base that is already in Go. And so for us, it was always, um, it was actually a big debate in the beginning whether it would be like Cosmos, and Cosmos, of course, had um, had that going for it that it was a Go thing, but in the end, like it. it it didn't win, I think, for the right reasons. And we decided, OK, let's start adopting Rust. But one thing we needed was definitely we needed our um, code base to be able to talk to, to the blockchain. And so we built MGS RPC, or Go Substrate RPC. Um, and it actually, I'm, I'm quite happy with um, sort of how it's been going. We got a grant from the Web3 Foundation to do like the initial project. Um, by now, I think it's used by, by, a couple, by a couple of people. I see like 
some of the first like external pull requests from the developers coming in. Like we're always happy to help supporting it. We're doing our best to keep it up to date with current Substrate Master or like whatever the stable release is going to be in the future. But um, um, that's that sort of that was one of the big missing pieces for us, and, and one thing we focused on sort of in, in getting ready and integrating it. Um, that I'm happy we're able to contribute to the ecosystem. Yeah, it's something we've seen from like a few um, like infrastructure providers. They don't want to deal with the decoded data um, right from the state. So um, yeah, getting good RPC and like codec support has been a really big thing. And like having that in multiple languages is definitely a plus for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, Maggie, you want to go last um, and talk about like what you've seen with uh, chains going into production and maybe like specifically with some of the consortium chains. Oh, okay. Uh, I've heard that uh, uh, among the Asian community, I've heard that the Plasma, Net the Plasma Network is going to launch mainnet in the middle of this year. And most of the substrate based projects are still waiting for the Polkadot mainnet launch of our and all the stable version of Substrate 2.0. Speaking of the challenges getting chains into production, I mean the substrate-based chain. One is that substrate is evolving at a surprising speed. Breaking changes happen all the time. So it's absolutely sending a great signal to the community that the party has a solid engineering capability, but it would also like bring a little trouble to the community teams. Yeah, that's all from my view. Yeah, okay. Um, so I have a question that we'll, we'll kind of pause between the plan sections here. Um, could you describe one practical use case of Substrate? Um, and we'll try to get this in language that is not super developer focused, um, but for somebody who's like outside of Substrate or Polkadot. Um, I'll leave, I'm not the, uh, the panelist on this one, so I'll let uh, somebody take it over. Well, let's go. Um, yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Thomas. Um, yeah, I, I'm struggling with the non-developer um, uh, uh, part. I think that's that's a big uh, difficult. Because I, I that's think all you do, right? You build tools for developers. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, for developers, but somebody who's like outside of the uh, yeah, I, community. I, I, I think it's like the the kind of um, it's the first time you really get a framework, right? It's. Um, I think it's not like the the specific use cases, but um, the the variety of things you can you can do with it, right? And you, um, I think I find it comparable to like when when like this whole uh, Web two thing thing started, and all these HTTP server frameworks popped up, and people really started to build like building just like small things, large things. Um, these kind of things, and so like a, for a developer um, like who's not familiar with that, I think that's that's a good analogy to make. And kind of um, if now this Web three is um, taking off, like you need the frameworks, you need to uh, that that alleviate a lot of the pain that you don't want to do HTTP parsing. Um, and this is kind of the 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 stage that the this whole uh, this whole field is in at the moment. Yeah, Lucas, do you have anything to add? Um, I mean, like one extreme way to say it is that, like, I think um, a lot of the innovation on the layer one level is being sort of commoditized. Um, so, like, whereas, I mean, crypto is still, blockchain is still extremely early. So, like, we're just at the start of this. But I think like, if you look at um, what what it is like if you're trying to build decentralized technology today um, and you want to do so using a blockchain to have some sort of coordination or like sort of fulfill some element like it would be a very bad investment to try to like build the 
peer discovery, transact like uh, block production me me mechanics, like transaction encoding, signing, right, and all of these parts by yourself. Like usually, there's like maybe a few things that you need to um, modify. Like we modified um, some parts in our runtime. Um, we modified. Um, we we worked a lot on sort of storage efficiency because we have just large amounts of data. Um, we but then like everything else, we sort of just picked standard components and saved ourselves a ton of time um, by doing so, right? And like it, and really like saved ourselves from like reinventing a lot of the tech stack that we'd have to have to do ourselves. Um, and so I think that's like really what what Substrate is, and I lot and, and, and I would say like it's, it's this framework that, that you mentioned, um, Thomas. Okay, hey, Maggie, do you want to add anything? Uh, okay, and because now like I'm not working on some like specific project, but I collect some information from the community around Asia, so I might bring some like some idea that that how the teams uh, in Asia or in China how they leverage uh, the uh, their project of the substrate. Uh, can I like show some experience of the community team? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. And uh, the first team that I interact with is uh, Darwinia Network. Uh, this team like focuses on the substrate based bridge and the NFT protocol inside the Polkadot X system. Uh, one thing which makes them different is that when we are talking about the bridges in Polkadot, what we actually mean is that the bridge other uh, blockchain into substrate. Uh, so this is the one-way bridge, while Darwinia network is working on the two-way bridges that are not only bridge other blockchain in, but also export the substrate-based chain to the outward. They did this by adding a Merkle Mountain Green root in the digest in block header which they call it a uh, supplied client. So you can see it's just a extension of the digest in substrate. And uh, as we know that to keep a light client like uh, of substrate, maybe in Ethereum smart contract is too expensive to sustain. Uh, Darwinia make this like possible by uh, uh, by what they call the super light client because the light client keeper don't need to submit each block header uh, into the each smart contract every time. Uh, the keeper can just update the current latest blockchain header uh, in its smart contract so it can be verified all the way up to the Genesis block. It's quite cool. And so it's like it's, lev it's leveraged on the feature of substrate like it can expand the, the digest item in the block header. And uh, another project I want to bring up is the owning TEE project in Asia. It's Fala Network. Uh, Fala is like, you can see it, a cross-chain confidential smart contract network. Uh, technically, Fala is a distributed TEE network for, like, for security and security reasons. The contract states are, distribute, are distributed among the TEE node. Each TEE node can run a completely different logic in the network. So it's just like uh, the parachain and the relay chain in Polkadot. It turns out this module of Fala network can adapt to the Polkadot's uh, XCMP naturally. And uh, also, and also, and the last uh, project I collect from the community. Uh, that impressed me is the uh, stablecoin project, uh, the Akala network. Basically speaking, I think the Akala is an upgraded version of MakerDAO. As we all know, that MakerDAO's liquidation and auction process rely on like other uh, DeFi projects like Uniswap and uh, sometimes fail to function. And the several factors like contributed to the failure, like the volatile collateral pr price, the gas price, uh, the network status. On the gas price and the network status side, uh, congestion is always an elephant in the room. It will result in like severe degraded system integrity. So including the Oracle service and liquidation process and die liquidation efficiency. But transactions in substrate are classified as either normal or, oper or operational. So 
uh, twenty percent of the space in each block is reserved for the operational transaction as a priority lane for important system transaction like uh, Oracle price bidding and uh, risk parameter adjustment, automatic liquidations. Uh, that is exactly the way to solve the uh, congestions. There's also an underlying obstacle to sustain the MakerDAO is that the barrier to becoming a keeper. So the keeper pool is non-custodial by centralized service and uh, you need some basic and precise knowledge to keep to run a keeper. And uh, so Akala is like a leverage on the substrate. It, uh, it has a built index so which enables almost everyone to be uh, a keeper and so pro so everyone can provide the liquidation to the whole system and this most like these three features are very famous among the china and uh, all of them are leveraged on some features of the substrate that uh, so they like like they give a high like they give a uh, like the a great sum up to the the, the, the substrate yeah, so like using the embedded light client and um, like tra like transaction construction, block construction stuff that kind of um, takes that responsibility away from the developer. So um, yeah, I think that's like the practical use case. Um, so yeah, let's move on to the final section of just like the future stuff that hasn't actually been built yet. Um, and there's a, a question from uh, hanging at Fela actually um, that I think we can kind of rope in to all of this. Um, which is uh, how will different projects leverage uh, cross-chain message passing? Um, so I have some like notes for each of you and like what you, what you guys are planning, but uh, maybe you can factor that in to your response of like what you think some practical use cases of cross-chain message passing will be. Um, so Lucas, start with you this time. Uh, I know you're working on a ZK verifier and NFTs um, based on Ink smart contracts. Um, so yeah, what, what does that look like and like the feature of Centrifuge? So, so centrifuge, like high, like centrifuge is, sees itself in like this DeFi ecosystem, right? Like we build like one part of, um, one one part of it, meaning like we, we help companies borrow money and like then make these assets liquid, make them available. But uh, centrifuge does not like it's not a complete ecosystem. Like we plug high into the DeFi ecosystem. So for us, like. The idea of cross-chain messaging, which is unfortunately still um, further away than I would like it to be, um, is that like our um, assets can be moved into other chains where they can be traded, where they can be used as collateral, for example, in a stable coin, um, and sort of all open up all of these use cases. And and I think like, that is that is like the the most um, um, like I think one of the most amazing things about the Ethereum ecosystem and sort of how that differentiates itself from, from, from uh, Bitcoin is just this extremely easy pluggability of different, um, and composability of different um, smart contract frameworks. And that um, is something that will be much harder with, um, with different chains, but as, but can actually be solved by cross-chain messaging. And, and, and I think like without Without this sort of coming down the road, I think like you you will invariably have um, it, it would be a, a, a non-starter for us to like build something outside of a, a chain that was like tried to be a DeFi ecosystem chain or something or, or, or something like that. But I really believe that like a way for for us and for this ecosystem to scale is to um, be able to go from composi composability happens within a chain to like composability can happen across chain by passing these messages. A message can be assets, it can be tokens, it can be um, all sorts of different things. Um, and and so, um, and just to answer the, sec the second part of your question about sort of what we're working on right now, um, like we deal with, um, we deal with assets that come from the business world where like privacy is much more of a hard requirement than on the end user level. I think, personally, I think it's ridiculous that people um, build like products on on blockchains today that don't offer a basic level of privacy. I actually, I think, I believe only sort of acceptable, um, like really 
online payment system that is a blockchain is like something that has privacy and Zcash. Um, I still use Ethereum for, for some experiments, but I would never want my personal um, transaction history to be public like that. And so, and, and that's also for our users um, the case. And so what, what we're, um, we're working on is zero knowledge verifier that can verify zero knowledge proofs, both for um, the BLS381 and BLS377 curve, but then also for, um, for, for, uh, for sort of um, um, recursive SNARKs using, using the SEXI protocol. And so that will um, allow us to implement um, non-fungible tokens that are minted um, in private that are valid, like where the business, where like some sort of logic validation and valuation is, is done in a SNARK, but then like verified on chain. Um, and that's what sort of is coming, coming next for us in, in uh, building out the capabilities of the chain. Cool. Um, Maggie, I think you already talked about like some of the projects launching uh, pretty soon in the last response, um, but maybe you want to talk about like uh, cross-chain message passing and uh, how you think that might factor in. Oh, okay. And uh, I mean, like, just as Luke said that, uh, like, like that's the point that we're expecting on the Polka dot. Uh, like, like, like we also want, like, uh, I think the uh, XMP, like the Polka dot, is really want what you are doing is re is re is really you are great at. So. Uh, with the XMP that we can enable the parachain like to do what they are great at and uh, uh, like also expand the Polkadot ecosystem and enable them to interact with each other. Um, like for now, um, so uh, for me and the whole community, like don't know exactly what the XMP is really look like, but I can tell that they are expecting very much on that. Great and uh, Thomas, like, what are you what are your plans for launching um, after you launch Radical Mainnet? Um, so we, we don't know. <laughs> we are we are. I think we're still um, quite away uh, from from Mainnet, um, and so I th yeah. So how we. Are approaching this at the moment, and how we want to approach this, uh, and this is, I think, one of one of the strengths is that we can be very iterative. Um, so since we can do these runtime upgrades, um, we can experiment with with different things. Uh, we can build a solid foundation. Um, so what we're trying now is kind of um, getting the kind of core core uh, domain model correct and then starting uh, with even after main it um, adding like features on top of that um, to these runtime upgrades I think like uh, this uh, cross chain message passing is not on the roadmap uh, for us for now but this is, a, this is definitely something we are looking into it but we kind of need to figure out how does it fit within the product um and but there's definitely a lot of use cases how um uh, like especially with with uh, uh with this whole sustainability aspect that we also want to want to tackle like um can you pay developers with with a different cryptocurrency uh, using our system kind of this stuff is, is very interesting yeah um so there's one more question in the uh in the question queue, but I know we started a few minutes late, and Lucas uh, has a, a another obligation. He's got to run, um, so I think it's mm -hmm. actually a good question to send into Discord. Um, it's to what extent did Parity's tools usage of Rust influence your choice to use it, and how do you like Rust so far? Um, so I don't know how pressed you are, Lucas. You can say something about that now, um, or we can push that I, in Discord. I think it was it, it was a big hurdle. Um, I like Rust, um, but hiring for it is a lot harder than it is for for Go, um, and so I think that is that was in the end the tooling won, even though even though it was in Rust, and I think long term it's the right decision. Um, I think long term also Rust can be a, an advantage from a purely technical point of view compared to Go, um, but but um, yeah, so it, it took us a bit of back and. and Back and forth, and then decided to go with it. And I'm I'm happy about that decision. 
Cool. Uh, Thomas? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm also, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we, we started really adopting Rust across across the stack. We have a, like the, the we are not only working with Substrate, but we are also building this uh, this uh, peer to peer layer uh, where we also base everything on Rust. So, and before we switched to Rust, we were using Haskell. Um, and so it's another language which with a very complex type system and where I can do a lot of advanced stuff and be very safe. Um, but so far, I think like this switch has really shown where, where Rust shines, which is just, this, the ecosystem is a lot larger. It's a lot more pragmatic, I, I believe. Um, yeah, so Substrate itself, I think, has is, uh, occupies a special place there because it's uh, taking a lot of things very far, uh, what you can do with Rust. Um, this is the stuff that, um, that you very often see with, with Haskell. Um, like the like people go crazy on on the type system or something like that and like uh with uh with substrate like for example uh, in in my my opinion they sometimes go a bit crazy on the macros um like, but overall i think like rust is a, a very very solid language and um like the the right choice for these kind of projects overall all right and we'll give maggie the last word on rust Oh, OK. Uh, I'm also new to Rust, uh, but I love it. <laughs> so basically speaking, Rust is like a language that I start to learn because it has a sharp learning curve. But after like after you you enter the gate and everything just becomes so simple, like it can. I like I like the two features of Substrate. One is that it can almost uh, abstract anything. And I think that's a reason that uh, I think that's a reason that the substrate can be so modular. And uh, the other one, uh, the other one is the macros in Rust. Uh, as we all know, that the substrate uses a lot of uh, macros in it, so it can make like cut, it, it it can make the runtime customization uh, so much simple. It's just like writing a smart contract, but now. Like in the last, like uh, in the last, you can just write some smart contract on the blockchain. But now you can use uh, like same logic to custom uh, blockchain, and uh, that's because the macros behind the substrate are uh, in Rust. So I can see that these two features of Rust that enable substrate to be so modular and uh, easy to hack. In. All right. So Thomas thinks that the macros are a little bit too far, and Maggie likes the macros. That sounds like a good thing. Uh, <laughs> to get a beer and go to this course, <laughs> keep arguing about. Uh, so yeah. we'll, do, um, I'll make a final plug for some Sub-Zero next week. We have a lot of cool talks from uh, community. Uh, Gav is going to talk about our weights and benchmarking system um, and some off-chain fragment, um, another like ink update. Um, yeah, click the register button and check out the full agenda. Um, and do you guys want to close with anything? Um. Yeah, so uh, you can find more uh, about Spot us on radical.xyz. Uh, we are actually now starting kind of what we call a friends and family net. So if you're interested in like trying it out for the first time, um, contact us. Uh, you can find more information on, on, our, um, on our discourse page. It's radical.community. Um, yeah. That's that's basically it, and we're like we're looking forward to to having people on board and like seeing how how decentralized code collaboration works. All right, awesome, Maggie. Ah, okay, and uh, like like at the end, uh, it seems that I, no, I've nothing else to elaborate more, and uh, so I'm gonna use a gesture in the last to express my feelings. Uh, like this one, live long and prosper for Web 3.0, for Polkadot, and for the substrate. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thanks for joining, Thomas and Maggie. Well, thanks for hosting. <laughs> and Lucas, who had to leave. Yeah. So. All right. See everybody on Discord. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.